Okay. So thank you all for joining us today for the Genocide and Human Rights uh, Fall Webinar Series. My name is Megan Reed and I'm the Operations Coordinator for the Zorian Institute and I will be the moderator for today's session. This series was created in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which disrupted the Institute's annual Genocide and Human Rights University program. After our first series this past summer, we found that there was a great response from participants who wanted to learn more about the different cases and theories of genocide and human rights studies. So we're back with the fall session. My colleague Jenna will be posting more information about the Institute's Genocide and Human Rights University program and how to get involved in the chat box. So look out for that. And a few housekeeping items before we begin. If you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box or raise your hand during the Q&A period at the end of the presentation. Um, and the Q&A period will be about 20 to 30 minutes long, um, and it would allow you the opportunity to also explore some of the discussion questions as well, which will be shared in the, the chat box. So without further ado, we'd like to introduce the, the session titled Indigenous Peoples of Brazil, A Case for Genocide with Professor Flavio de Leo Bastos Pereira. Professor Pereira has a PhD in political and economic law and is completing his postdoc at the Re Reggio Calabria University in Italy. He is a member of the roster of experts of International Nuremberg Principles Academy. He is a 2014 graduate of the Institute's Genocide and Human Rights University program hosted at the University of Toronto and has gone on to continue his research in the field. He is also a member of the International Network of Genocide Scholars. Professor Pereira, welcome. We're so happy to have you here with us today. Thank you, Megan uh, uh, and Gina. It's, I'm very happy to join you again. And, and, and anyway, to be at Zorian again, I'm, I'm really happy. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for joining us today. We're so happy to have you back as well. Thank you. And to all our colleagues and researchers that are with us in this afternoon. Well, uh, may I start? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I will share my my slides. Well, um, uh, what I, I'm going to talk about the situation of the indigenous Brazilian nations, uh, the hard situation they are going through. But uh, uh, I will try to give to you uh, an overview on our on our history, our indigenous nations' history. Well, I think you can you can see my my slide, right? I will uh, uh, send to you after the presentation to to share with our colleagues here. And anyway, uh, I would like to outline my my the main tops of my presentation. Well, first of all, I will uh, I must talk about a general information about Brazil, about their uh, about its indigenous uh, nations and um, why uh, we live today we live nowadays under a very hard situation but not only why we have now uh, a government uh, declared anti-indigenous but uh, also because we have a history of persecution in brazil so my first topic is the general information about brazil and its indigenous nations my second topic uh, tells about persecution and extermination along our history, the colonization period, the military dictatorship, which effects we feel uh, still today, because in Brazil, our transitional justice uh, was not completed as, for example, uh, in Argentina. Uh, then I'll talk about our redemocratization period and about Bolsonaro government. And finally, I'll uh, I will share with you some reflections about the legal concept of genocide. Uh, I don't know if my dear friend, uh, the judge of the International Criminal Court, the Brazilian judge, Silvia Steiner, is with us. And she's a, a very close friend of mine and an inspiration about these studies. And I will try to give to you the view of the legal concept of genocide and why I understand in relation to the indigenous nations, it's not enough. Well, general information. Brazil is a very large country, a very beautiful country, with a very friendly people. Uh, around 211 million people. Our territory is very, is very large too. We, we, we have a very extensive uh, frontier. 
uh, more than eight, eight million kilometers. Our port, uh, the, our idiom is Portuguese because we were colonized by Portugal. If uh, for you to have a a, a, a brief uh, view about our indigenous nations, when the Portuguese uh, got to Brazil, uh, we we do not have a, a, a very a very uh, exactly concor concordance about the number, but the researchers establish a number between four million and six million indigenous individuals in Brazil. We can, for example, make a comparison now. Portugal population that time uh, was no more than one million two hundred habitant in inhabitants. So uh, the indigenous uh, in the Americas at that time from Canada to Argentina and Chile, uh, were around 8 million individuals. Nowadays, in Brazil, we have no more than 896,000 individuals. So, uh, uh, that's a question, right? Uh, uh, I have an opinion that the quantity is not enough to give us an idea of the brutality of a regime. We, can, we cannot say, we cannot compare uh, one dictatorship with the, another dictatorship, because the quantity is not a, 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 a criteria, a safe criteria for to understand the brutality. But we lost in Brazil around four or five million indigenous individuals. In Latin America, it's very important to, 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 to inform our colleagues from, uh, from the North Hemisphere, from Asia. I, I know we have many friends here, from Armenia, my, our dear Armenia, from Asia, from other continents, it's very important to, to, to inform that Latin America is an indigenous continent. It, it, and still today, even after an historical genocide, we can uh, verify the indigenous population, for example, in Mexico, 15%, uh, uh, in Nicaragua, 80%, in Guatemala, uh, we had a wonderful lecture about Guatemala genocide in, at Soria. And in Brazil, they are no more than 0.4 or 5%. In Brazil, we do not have the largest indigenous population, but we have the largest number of different indigenous nations. We have here in Brazil, uh, around 305 different ethnic groups with different languages, with different religions, with different uh, 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 way of life, clothes, etc. And now, and also we, uh, and this, this data I'm telling you about is from 10 years ago when we had our last census. We have now, to, uh, uh, according to, to the government, 274 different languages. These different languages, they are a kind of, uh, they are developed from three main languages. The language G, the language Macroge, and the language Tupi. From these three languages, we had uh, developed uh, all this uh, 274. And this indigenous population occupies around 12% of the Brazilian territory. Here, I must tell you that our, uh, our, uh, our government, Bolsonaro's government, and all that uh, political view that anti-indigenous used to say that we had a lot of lands for small Indians. They are traditional lands. But I could tell you that we have around uh, nine, uh, uh, 500,000 indigenous living in these lands, in this 12% of the lands, of the Brazilian lands. But we have around 97,000 farmers occupying more than 20% of the Brazilian territory. If you take a look at Brazilian territory, more than 8 million kilometers, you can have an idea uh, how few families 
occupy large percentage of our territory. Well, uh, please, if you have any doubts, Megan, you can tell me, okay? Uh, another important uh, information, besides these uh, uh, 80, 196,000 individuals, and besides these 305 different nations, we also have around 100 uncontacted tribes, uncontacted groups that have never kept contact with the dominant society. Uh, I don't, uh, 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 when I studied Zorian, uh, I thought about, I reflected a lot uh, the idea of civilization with Professor Christopher Power, that was our professor at Zorian. And uh, then I, I, I tried to avoid using this term for our dominant society. I, I, really, I really have doubts if we are civilized, and I'll tell you why. Uh, so we have this uh, indigenous Brazilian group that never uh, uh, have any contact with this uh, industrialized capitalist society. You can see at the map three red points in the world when we, have, we still have uncontacted tribes. Asia, uh, Oceania, and the Amazon. The South American Amazon, the Brazilian Amazon, the Amazon of, in Venezuela and Peru, for example. These 100 groups are the most of them inside the Brazilian Amazon. Why in the Brazilian Amazon? Because they are fleeing from the contact. They know by their oral tradition that any direct contact means death by disease or by direct extermination. Yes, when the farmers, when some farmers, when uh, 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 for example, cattle breeders uh, uh, and, and other other interested in the land richness, they discover these groups. The extermination is in almost immediately. And to uh, so you can you can uh, they run to the forest. They try to flee to avoid the contact. You can see these dramatic images. Uh, in the Amazon, Brazilian Amazon, when a group, uh, we call them Maita Nation, the Maitas, uh, they are uh, frightened with the airplane that took these photographs. You can, you can see, you can uh, uh, realize it in their faces. Uh, other images, we don't know nothing about their paintings, their graphisms, their uh, way of life, as I had told you. This is another interesting image because they are from a non-nation, the Yanomamis. Yanomamis are very famous nations in the world, even outside Brazil. Uh, but uh, we need to understand their, their social framework. We have m different locations, Yanomami locations. Uh, as we live in different cities, uh, they, uh, they do it also, but uh, this location, specifically this location, is uh, 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 isolated. They isolate themselves from the contact. To, to show you, I'd like to show you now a two-minute video about this context. It shows, uh, it's from, uh, it's a BBC production that shows a Brazilian anthropologist uh, recording these uncontact, uncontacted tribes to prove that they exist because the Peru government and other governments, they used to say they do not, that they do not exist. Why? Because it's easier to colonize and to, to increase the pressure over the forests. So it's a two minutes video. Please, uh, you can, you can uh, realize the beauty of the nation. Jose Carlos Morales is on his way to the remote headwaters of the Imbira River in Brazil. The dense Amazon forests below are home to one of the last uncontacted tribes. Uncontacted tribes left on Earth. 
Morales works for Brazil's Indian Affairs Department, and his job is to monitor the tribe's lands for signs of invaders. Primeiro que são povos meio que desconhecidos, né? É difícil convencer até o próprio Estado, né, que eles existem. But the pressures on these forests are growing, and Morales knows that he has to convince those who doubt the tribes live here at all. For the first time, he's allowed a BBC film crew to travel with him. Powerful zoom lenses will allow them to film from a kilometer away and minimize disturbance. E não acreditando que eles existem, não vai ter nenhum movimento a favor deles. E uma imagem às vezes vale por mil relatórios, por mil palavras. Está aqui. gardens are full of manioc, their main food. They're also growing bananas and papaya. And there are hundreds of anato trees. The tribe makes bright red body paint from the crushed seeds. Morellis has been monitoring this tribe for 20 years, but he fears their lives are about to change for the worse. Illegal logging across the border in Peru is forcing uncontacted tribes there to flee. E de repente começou a aparecer uns isolados lá que não, não eram de lá. É óbvio, qual é o único lugar para onde esses isolados podem correr? É para lá de cá, não tem para onde mais correr. But instead of expelling the loggers, Peru's government has suggested that uncontacted tribes don't exist at all. É a única maneira da gente poder mostrar ao resto da humanidade que esses povos existem. É melhor. Isso do que ele entrar em contato com um bando de garimpeiro ou com um madeireiro, que vão matá-los no primeiro vez que virem, não vão fotografar, vão atirar neles e matar. And it's not just violence that puts uncontacted people at risk. Viruses, like the common cold, can kill them and even wipe the tribes out completely. Eu, a minha utopia seria que esses povos tivessem primeira opção de escolha, né? Nós vamos continuar, nós vamos entrar em contato. É a terra, você conseguir o espaço e manter esse espaço livre de interferência, de qualquer interferência, que é a única forma dos índios isolados sobreviver, não tem outra forma. Ok, so uh, we can realize the importance of the preservation of the traditional land. The, the, the main point, if you want to talk about physical existence, if you want to talk about cultural existence, if you want to talk about health during the COVID pandemic in the world, any kind of fundamental and human rights, first of all, in relation to the indigenous nations, all over the world, the land is the main topic. And this is what is at risk in Brazil nowadays. So uh, I, I would like to say to you that this context, as uh, you have seen the image, uh, it's kept uh, only by airplane. There's a principle in Brazil by, uh, established by the anthropologists since 1985, the non-direct -con contact principle we cannot uh, be a direct contact with this, these groups because of the risks that they are uh, submitted to. So, after this general view, I must tell you about, a little about how persecution, uh, extermination, and racism until today achieve, uh, 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 has the indigenous nations and the black population in Brazil as a target. Uh, many think outside Brazil, think that Brazil is a, a, a racial democracy. No, Brazil is a racist country. Uh, we have a, what we call a, a, a kind of 
uh, uh, structural racism. We have Professor Silvio Almeida in Brazil that now is at Duke University in the US. Uh, Adilson Moreira, uh, Jamila Ribeiro, and other uh, thinkers that uh, uh, deal with this, this point, this issue. Our, uh, the first uh, uh, law I could tell you, the, re the religious law, was written by the Pope uh, Nicholas V. It's the Romanus Pontifex Papal Bull that expressly in 1454 uh, gave the permission, legitimated the invasions, the conquest, the submission, and the enslavement of the enemies of Christ. We are talking about that uh, old civilizations in Brazil, the indigenous peoples of the Americas, they are here. Uh, we, we have proof about anthropological proofs and, and archaeological proofs about their presence in the Americas from more than 40,000 years. The second Papal Bull was written by Pope Alexander VI from the Borgias, if I'm not wrong. And uh, he reiterated and uh, reinforced the permission to steal the land. I'm using here uh, uh, the exactly expression in the Papal Bull, to steal the lands, the island, to submit the inhabitants of the new world <clears throat> to reduce them to the Christian faith. This is a, a, a hot topic uh, today in Brazil uh, about the assimilation. But they, uh, these were Papal Bulls from the Vatican. In Brazil, a Portuguese uh, governor, uh, Marquês de Pombal, Marquis of Pombal, wrote in 1757 a norm, a, a, an act which is named Pombal Directory or Indians Directory. He expelled the religious orders from Brazil. And then the idea was now the indigenous nations in Brazil will become uh, Portuguese, like us, submitted to the Portuguese king. And then, this was a, a, a kind of assimilation, but the consequences were a disastrous disaster. Why? Because if I al allow the access to the indigenous land, to the white people, to the Europeans, and to the new Brazilians that were born in Brazil, non-indigenous individuals, what, hap what, the, what did happen? They took the land, they uh, violated the, the women. This is a, 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 a kind of a specific, uh, uh, specific research, the drama of the indigenous women. And in Brazil nowadays, uh, the indigenous women are the leaders of, the, of their rights movement, the women. And with this act, uh, the consequence was that the land was stolen, the women were, were violated, and until today, in the big cities of Brazil, the poor districts uh, are uh, a legacy of these invasions to their communities. It was really a disaster. I, I could say to you that the first sense of citizenship that was offered to the indigenous was the assimilation. But assimilation is genocide. I'm not talking under the 19, uh, 1948 UN Convention. I'm talking about the Raphael Lemkin vision, and I will return to this point soon. So, uh, after, uh, if you consider the, the year of the Brazil's independence, 1822, when it got to 1822, there were no more than 600,000 indigenous. They were 5 million, and uh, 300 years later, they were no more than 600. It's a genocide. It, 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 uh, for sure, it's a genocide. We do not have doubts about that. But, uh, and I would like also to establish an historical connection when we study the Holocaust, when we study the Armenian genocide, 
when we study the Namas and the Rerus genocide in Africa, in Namibia, between 1904 and 1907, we must consider the, the memory, historical memory, of the indigenous reserves in the Americas. In the US, in Canada, with the first people, and uh, in, also in the Latin America. John Tolan, a biographer of Adolf Hitler, in this book, uh, uh, it, it has a very interesting information. Hitler's concept of concentration camps, as well as the practica practicality of genocide owed much, so he claimed, to his studies of English and United States history. He admired, Hitler admired, the camps for Boer prisoners in South Africa and for the Indians in the Wild West, and often praised to his inner circle the efficiency of America's extermination by starvation and uneven combat of the Red Savages. Red Savage is a, a racial, a, a, a racialist expression, as Indian is a racialist expression. Indian, those, if you know, uh, 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 have a, a, a small knowledge of the Spanish language, Indio, uh, no God, India, no God. Uh, it's a racial, uh, ex racialist expression. They're of the Red Savage who could not be tamed by captivity. Uh, what I want to tell is that all the dynamics and frameworks of the extermination of the indigenous in the Americas is also an historical experience as the Armenian genocide was not uh, 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 the world did not pay the adequate, uh, adequate attention to the Armenian genocide. That's why we can achieve more and more systematically genocides in the world. But the indigenous was the first, uh, if, you, if, we, if we consider the colonization. You have here the mention of the book for those who are interested. Now, uh, I, I talk about the second phase of Brazil history in this context, our military dictatorship. In 1964, uh, the military uh, promoted a coup against the elected government of Brazil. What, uh, uh, what were the, the main aspects of this, uh, of this movement? Anti-communism, anti developmentalism, let, a kind of, I could say, I'm sorry, but I could say a kind of, let's make Brazil great again. Something like that. Well, Develop, a development model based on expropriation of Indian resources by multinationals and large private corporations and by the state. There, 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 were, there was a kind of conluio, a kind of um, uh, a complicity between the government, the military government, and multinational interested in, in the indigenous lands. Uh, this is a book that you can find in, in Canada, in the US, because it was written by Shelton Davis. Shelton Davis was an American indigenous that lived in Brazil between our uh, indigenous peoples. And he wrote in 1973, during the dictatorship, this book, Victims of the Miracle. I, 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 this is a very important issue. I, I, I'll put you now a question. i put to you now a question. Is genocide uh, restricted to death uh, squads like the Anzeitsruppen in East Europe? Or, I, or can I promote genocide suppressing the economical and fundamental basis for the existence of a group? This is a question that we are facing today with the destruction of the Amazon by the current government in Brazil. So, we had repression, we have imprisonment, torture, rapes against the female political opponents, forced disappearance and murders of indigenous individuals. 
in the, the indigenous nations in Brazil, they have, they are, they suffer with a kind of invisibility. Everybody talks about the missing people, political opponents that are missing until today uh, due to the actions of the dictatorship. But after the report of our National Truth Commission, we had in Brazil a National Truth Commission, as we had in Canada, the Truth Commission for the schools for indigenous children. We had it here also. Uh, in this report, we could prove the, uh, the murder of more than 8,000 indigenous individuals. This, is, uh, this report is in Portuguese, but it's at, at uh, your disposal at the internet. And uh, during the, our dictatorship, we had, for sure, like Shelton Davis wrote, the dispossession of thousands of rural migrants from Brazilian Northeast, people from the countryside, poor people. That's why during our dictatorship, the large cities in Brazil became much more populated because people were starving in the countryside. And the regime uh, was a kind of, uh, they, they make it easier for the farmers to take lands. We had cases of indigenous that had, indigenous nations that had their children uh, kidnapped by and took by Brazilian airplanes to the other side of the country because the parents would go behind them and then the lands were ready to be colonized by farmers. This all, what, what I'm telling you now is all of this, these informations are uh, documented. Deforestation of the Brazilian Amazon, it's a node problem in Brazil, especially during our dictatorship. What we are facing today is a, a, a node idea. We need to deforestate the Amazon to make, uh, to create uh, uh, monocultures. Farmers must do it. And our biosphere, our biomas are under risk, were under risk, and now with a captain, a node captain of the army as president, these ideas are back again. Uh, our National Truth Commission uh, uh, has a, a, a declaration. We have a declaration in this report that I, 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 thought, I thought it was very clear to you. We had in Brazil a serious violations of human rights suffered by indigenous nations between 1946 and 1988. Flavio, Professor Flavio, why are you talking about 1946 if the Brazilian dictatorship uh, started with a coup of state in 1964? Because the Brazilian indigenous nations had been victims of the successive Brazilian government, all of them, some better, some worse. And the report also uh, 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 informs us these violations are systemic as a result of the state structural policies. And then, in this point, I come back again to the concept of genocide. Well, it's not only the totalitarian model of state, a, a, a Nazi state, for example, that has the, the, the instruments to, to, to practice a genocide, but also the liberal democracies of the West. This is very important uh, to, to, to consider here. And the report also say the state directly acted or was uh, uh, remained silent on such violations because we have cases of direct murders by the state's uh, workers against the indigenous in Brazil. But we also have ca had cases. For example, the farmer used an airplane to bomb, to bomb indigenous communities under the silence of the Brazilian government during our dictatorship. Such violation is not sporadic. They are not accidental. 
This is very important. I show you this case, the Sinta Larga nation, a very important nation, indigenous nation in the Amazon. This is known as the massacre of the parallel 11. When some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, land miners, farmers use it, airplanes to bomb these communities. And after that, they gave, they, distrib they distributed poisoned food and toys to the indigenous children. We have in Brazil, for example, another case. Uh, uh, this nation was named Goitacazes. The Goitacazes was a nation that was totally destroyed. They do not exist anymore. Uh, in the 16th, 17th centuries, because they received poisoned clothes to wear. This is a, a kind of bacteriological war that was practiced in the US, in Canada, in Australia, and also in Brazil. Uh, this is the region you can see here, the region had this massacre uh, happened. Another, just a figure, uh, just an image for you to have an idea. The Umuchimas was uh, extinct too. This is a shaman, a religious leader of the Umuchimas in 1957. Uh, they, they were totally exterminated by epidemics, and for, by diseases. Uh, in, in a first historical moment, the Portuguese didn't know that a simple flu could kill all, exterminate all a nation. But after that, this was a bacteriological uh, gen, a kind of gen used against indigenous. I could tell you also uh, about the Krenak nation reformatory. We have a nation here, the Krenaks, in the state of Minas Gerais, a very old nation. They have more than 15,000 years of existence. They were reduced now to 400 people. And during our dict military dictatorship, a prison was built in the Krenak lands. And in this prison, we had murders, violations, sexual violences, uh, 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 beatings, starving indigenous, ind and indigenous that were brought from all the regions of Brazil to that land. Can you imagine? We are talking about 300 different nations. Imagine if we put Portuguese, Canadians, French, British in a concentration camp. That's why I, I see a kind of connection between what the happenings of the 20th century. Uh, uh, so, and when the, uh, in around 1961, two brothers, they are named, the three brothers, the Villas Boas brothers, they, uh, fall, uh, they were in an expedition and they fall in love with the Indian nations. And after a, a long, long, long way, they created the Xingu National Park. Xingu is in the center of Brazil. You can see Brazil's map here. And in, in a little red sign here, you can see the Xingu Park. We have here today around 15 different nations. Uh, 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 and and this, this sacred land for us is now under uh, extremely danger due to the great infrastructural constructions like the, uh, for example, the Belo Monte Dam, the third largest dam in the world. You can see it here. Uh, in 1973, and this is a very important fact, we have the construction in Brazil of a binational dam. Uh, Binational because they, uh, it was constructed uh, by Brazil and Paraguay states. That time, they were two dic military dictatorship. Stroessner, the Paraguay dictator, and Medici, uh, the Brazilian dictator. Under the Medici government, a lot of people were tortured, killed, and disappeared. And this dam, uh, this is a very important issue. When a dam is, is constructed in a country like Brazil, 
I'm not talking a country like Germany that now uh, has a compromise with new ru new renewal uh, 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 energies. Brazil, India, uh, even US, they still use uh, polluting uh, uh, energies uh, uh, elements. What is the idea that we receive from, from this government? We are going into the development. We are becoming a development, uh, a developed uh, country. But this is, not, this is an idea that makes natural or invisible the suffering and the extermination of these groups. When Itaipu was constructed in 1973, and nowadays the Brazilians go to Itaipu and take photographs, take images as a remembrance. But when it was constructed under a $16 billion value and expenses, uh, one point three uh, 1,500 kilometers were uh, of area between Brazil and Paraguay was floated. The, uh, we, had, we used to have a very beautiful uh, 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 waterfall, like Niagara, for example. Seven Falls was the name. It disappeared. There was no uh, a good uh, environmental study. And we lost 32 different indigenous land of the Ava Guarani traditional lands. They call these traditional lands Tecohas. Tecoha is a traditional land of the Ava Guarani nation. In Sao Paulo, where I live, we have a community of Ava Guaranis, a very poor. They are under misery because when their lands are stolen, they do not have as to keep their uh, their economy, their traditional economy, not a capitalist uh, model of economy. And uh, this is this Im image here, these two images, uh, uh, I choose two between uh, uh, others, show the workers of the Taipu Dam Company and from the uh, and from a governmental structure together, they went to the Guaranese lands, expelled them by gunned men, and then they put a fire in the Guaranese houses, in the Guaranese homes, uh, uh, buildings. You, are, you can see here the symbol of the, of the company in the truck, the white truck here, and behind it, the firing, uh, we call in Brazil uh, the house of the indigenous Ocas or Malocas. These Ocas were firing uh, after a, a, a great violence. One of the military uh, responsibles, General José Costa Cavalcante, he was the first general director of the Itaipu Dinational, he used to say, the animals for the refugee, for the refuge, the Indians for Paraguay. So uh, I, I still, I, I do not understand how there are people that do not understand as a genocide in Brazil. Professor Flavia, we have um, Professor Joyce Absol with her hand up with a question. Is it okay that I? Yeah. Yeah, oh, yes, okay, okay, okay. Just grant her access. Professor Absol, can you hear us? You might have to unmute your microphone. Yes, I did. Thank you. Flavio, it's wonderful to see you. Uh, I, I, I'm missing you a lot, Professor Absol. How are you? <laughs> I'm wonderful. When you have time, can you talk to uh, the question of, is this colonial settler? Uh, it, uh, were uh, how, the amount of people who actually settled from Europe uh, or did they use a divide and rule as part of what they were doing? And finally, the ideology of destruction. Okay, I, I can talk about that. I can talk about that. Uh, 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 Professor Epso, I will include this comment 
uh, inside what I, I have to talk now because I'm finishing and then we can develop this idea. A very good question, uh, in, indeed. Thank you, Professor Apsel. Uh, well, in 1967, we had a new a, a report in 1967 produced by the, uh, the military government itself. It's named Figueiredo Report. Figueiredo, Jader Figueiredo, was a, a kind of public lawyer, a, a, a procurator, we can say. And he was uh, responsible to travel all over Brazil and to, dis, to, to register what was, was happening to the Brazilian indigenous nation. And then, after 16,000 kilometers of expedition, he published this report in a press uh, uh, collective uh, uh, event. And then he published that the extermination of the indigenous nations in Brazil was a reality. Mass murder of the members of many different uh, nations, communities, torture, uh, cruelties, sexual violence. And uh, in this report from 1967, says that the practice of the most varied cruelties against Indians throughout the national territory, both by land owners and by officials of the Indigenous Protection Service, SPI, demonstrate the existence of a genocidal state. Due to this, uh, you have here the link to read this report. Unfortunately, it's in Portuguese, but we can uh, uh, eventually uh, produce it. And due to this report, the Sunday Times from 1969 published this, uh, 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 this front page new about the Brazilian genocide. And in that time, one of the officials of the Brazilian military government used to say, we think that the ideas of preserving the indigenous population within their natural habitat are very beautiful ideas but they are not realistic. The idea was the assimilation. Assimilation, as the thinking of Raphael Lemkin, is ethnocide, genocide. Belo Monte Dam, as, as we are talking about what happened and its legacy to the present time, I could tell you another example from nowadays. Uh, a few years ago, Belo Monte Dam was constructed, even uh, facing uh, uh, the, uh, conviction, the conviction of the Brazilian state before the Inter-American uh, Commission of Human Rights. 80%, only for you to have an idea of this environmental and uh, genocidal impact, 80% of the important river that we call Xingu River well, has been diverted, 80%. The river became dry in this region. Between the channel and the reservoir, 516 kilometers quadrant meter of land was flooded, an area bigger than Chicago City. Of this area, 400 kilometers were native forest, native. And I'm not talking about Bolsonaro's government. I'm talking about a, 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 a Dilma's government that was much better to the indigenous nation than Bolsonaro. There was a violation of the right to previous consultation and free prior and informed consent of indigenous communities. I'm talking about the convention 169 of the International Labor Organization, a, 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 a mandatory international convention. Brazil simply ignored it. Uh, so I'm now I'm going to talk about Bolsonaro's government. Since 2019 until now, we have elections here in 2022. 22. Probably uh, the defeat of Trump 
was a very good news for those who do not like uh, the, the current government. But the ethnocide, the genocide, became almost a declared uh, purpose. I show you here uh, a new from the New York Times from August 2019. A uh, uh, mention by Bolsonaro. The North American cavalry were the competent ones because they decimated their indigenous people in the past. And today, they don't have this problem in their country. Can you imagine a chief of state declaring it? Well, it's in the New York Times. You have the link here to, to confirm. But I have other, other uh, visions. From January 23rd, from this year, 2020, the Indians are evolving more and more. They are human beings like us. This is a kind of thinking, a kind of vision that you could, uh, 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 we could uh, input to Adolf Hitler's phrase. This is a very serious uh, thinking about indigenous nations. Uh, you can, after read with, um, with more time, the other, uh, the other declarations, but they uh, are mainly uh, relating to uh, an idea that a kind of, in my government, there won't be a link of indigenous lands demarcated to them. Well, we have some measures proposed by the Brazilian government. Proposal for a constitution amended 215, 215. Who are competent in Brazil, who have competence in Brazil to demarcate the indigenous lands? the executive power, the president, the president. Uh, they try to change this competence to our Congress, to our parliament. But our parliament is totally dominated by the farmers, by the multinationals interested in our indigenous lands. For you to have an idea, Brazil was discovered by the Portuguese in uh, 1,500. We have now, in 2018, the first indigenous women elected in Brazil. We do not have a, 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 a fair representation in our Congress. That's why, if I change this competence, we will have never more a demarcated land, indigenous lands in Brazil. What is demarca the demarcation of these lands? The Brazil Brazil's state recognize that inside a certain area, nobody can uh, explore this land. It's an indigenous land. Well, we have another uh, very important discussion because the first one they are about the amendment now is freeze it, I could say. But we have now the timeline thesis. What is the timeline time thesis? Our Brazilian constitution, the democratic one, was promulgated in October 5th, 1988. This is the, our, the birth of the, our democratic uh, uh, period with our new constitution, 35 years now. Suddenly, someone created a, th a thesis, an idea. Uh, the indigenous nations, will have recognized their right to their lands if they prove that on October 5th, 1988, they were occupying effectively the, your, these lands. But how can this idea be serious if since 1,500, they have been stolen from their lands. This is not a serious idea, but now in November, our Brazilian Supreme Court will decide in a case promoted against the Xoclengs nation. Xoclengs nation is a nation from the south of Brazil of the state of Santa Catarina. And uh, a farmer and organization are trying to have their lands. 
if our Supreme Court decides that the timeline thesis must prevail, it's the end of the future of our indigenous nations. On the other hand, you have the indigenous, uh, we call indigen indigenato, indigenous position that uh, recognize the, the aspect of the traditionality of these lands. And I hope this will be the, the victor, victorious position. The judgment will happen now in November, must happen now in November. Another action of the current government the emptying of the budgets of the administrative uh, and public structures that must, that should protect our indigenous nations according to our constitution. FUNAI, I could say, I could translate to uh, uh, National uh, Indigenous Foundation uh, lost their budget and some uh, anti-indigenous uh, 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 men's men were uh, uh, designated to to direct the actions of this. What must be a protective structure for the indigenous is nowadays uh, uh, an opposite to their rights. The NGOs in Brazil are being persecuted. Have been uh, they are being uh, they had also uh, uh, achieved by this budget uh, uh, elimination, for example. And now there's a new proposal for law, 2633, from this year, that must uh, uh, guarantee the honesty for those invaders of the union's lands. For by the Article 2, 131 of the Brazilian constitution, the indigenous lands are lands of the union. If I give amnesty to someone that invaded the union's lands, probably the indigenous lands, part of them at least, are targeted in this proposal if it will be approved. We are fighting against this absurd. Well, and then I, I, I got to my conclusion. What is genocide? What is ethnocide? We must remember that after the Second World War, when in 1948, uh, 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 thanks to Rafael Lemkin, who had the approval of a UN convention, uh, it, it was a, a very important step for humanity. But in my uh, in my personal vision, it's, it, it suffers of a lack of efficiency, of a, 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 it's not, a, 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 it all works, it does not work. Why it doesn't work? Because uh, we have to prove the intention, for sure. If you, if you have a, a legal, criminal, technical perspective, we have to prove the intention, for sure. But genocide, in my view, is not restrict, an idea restricted to a criminal technical perception. And this was the idea of Raphael Lemkin. Uh, I have a, a, a vision of Raphael Lemkin here. Uh, genocide for him is the destruction of the essential basis of the life of a certain group. Destruction of the essential basis. Then I give an example. We have in Brazil an epidemic, epidemi, it's considered epidemic or epidemic, uh, uh, forgive my English, uh, because we have a large number of suicides from indigenous boys and girls from 10 years old, 11 years old, because they are between two different worlds. And this is very, a, a very serious problem. When they lost their lands, they become miserable people in the big cities, suffering with the racism of the, of the population, of the majority. 
they lost their references and they commit suicide. We have a high number of suicides of indigenous boys and girls in Brazil. And now I don't know exactly why the number of girls are, uh, are, are becoming higher. And Rafael Lenkin says, the destruction of essential base of the life of a certain group seeking its extinction. And now he say, he writes, we can interpret and reflect on the possibility extinction of a given group by eliminating other references pertaining to such a victimized group, such as, for example, its culture. That's why the Nazis uh, uh, for, forbid the Polish culture during the occupation. Poland did not exist so far. It's forbidden the university for Polish. It's forbidden the theater for Polish. The way of life, their beliefs. Oh, they have to become Christian as we are, or uh, Muslim as we are, or Buddhist as we are. I, I remember now Myanmar, for example. Uh, uh, the way of its beliefs, the disintegr disintegration of its political and social structure and institutions, languages. For example, our Brazilian constitution, our current Brazilian constitution, guarantees the education in Portuguese and also in their mother tongue. But it's not, uh, it's not a reality in Brazil. I could say also about the health system. We have a specific health system for indigenous nations in Brazil, but it's not uh, observed by the government. And, and even so by the other governments. That's why COVID is killing more indigenous individuals than non-indigenous. Because you could say, well, they do not have the, the immunological uh, memory. Uh, they were exterminated by diseases. But even we do not have this immunological uh, 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 memory. Why they are the main victims in Brazil? Because they do not have, they have been uh, uh, deprived from the last centuries from a, a good health system. And Rafael Lenkins also say, uh, says, from this perspective, the question is, in the case of indigenous peoples, do their traditional lands constitute a fundamental basis for their existence? Yes. All the, these problems, they could be more, uh, they could be uh, 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 eliminated if the indigenous lands were really, really and uh, uh, secure, preserved. I, I should say to you that Raphael Lemkin wrote his ideas in his famous book, Axis Ruling Occupied Europe, published in 1944. I remember Professor Apsel and we talked a lot about his book in 2014 in Toronto. And, uh, but uh, some recent discoveries of uh, Rafael Lenkin's writings shows that he had the intention to write a collection of analysis. One of these books should be about the indigenous of South America. Because we had an, a genocide in Argentina, in Chile, for example, in Chile, the Mapuches, Mapu means land, Mapuches, those that are from the lands, from the lands. Some four Mapuche were uh, convicted in Chile by terrorism because they were in a, in, a, in a parade against the government and put fire in a house, an empty house from the government. Well, they were accused of terrorism and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights uh, convicted the Chile state against this. No, it was a, a, a violation of liberty of speech against uh, a policy that is against the Chileans indigenous. 
Uh, it happens in Brazil. It happens in Argentina now. Argentina is better, but Argentina exterminated their, their indigenous lands, uh, uh, nations too. And I should uh, mention to you, I like him a lot, Martin Shaw. Martin Shaw, a British researcher, he wrote uh, uh, in his book, What is Genocide? The idea of a sociological perception of genocide. And he says, Lemkin was looking for a term and the law that brought together a world class of violent and humiliating actions against members of collectivities. Genocide was not a specific type of violence. Lemkin considered it to include not only organized violence, but also economic destruction and persecution. This is very important. Because when we stole, when the state stole uh, uh, indigenous lands, the state killed their economy, their way of life, and the way of life that preserved the environment. Because they know where they need to cultivate, where they need, to, when they need to change the area. They have a very ancient uh, medicine knowledge and. Martin Shaw says, uh, what concerned him, uh, Lemkin, was precisely the common threat of these types of actions. It's threat to the existence of a collectivity and therefore to the social order itself. We are talking about a, a, a broader, uh, um, a broader, uh, 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 scenario of killing instruments. And uh, then I, I must ask to you, for sure that uh, uh, we have a criminal concept. You must remember that Rafael Lemkin was working on an idea of genocide much before the Second World War. When the Second World War started, and Winston Churchill declared a BBC transmission, at the BBC transmission, there's a crime without name happening in Europe. So the, the, the worry was, we must have a, 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 an international criminal, a, an international crime for this situation. And then genocide became restricted to this idea. But it's not in its origin. And then <clears throat> Rafael Lemkin says, the essence of genocide rests in the attempt to destroy a nation or an ethnic group by different means. In his book, he writes, biological means, economical, economic means, uh, 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 cultural means. Rafael Lemkin himself wrote ethnocide. And uh, finally, to conclude my presentation, I come back to Martin Shaw. We need to move, I propose, toward the main stage of sociological conceptualization, the formation of structural concept, structural concept, uh, concept. That's what our National Truth Commission wrote about indigenous. We have a structural genocide in Brazil. This means moving away from the subjective meaning of genocide direction, moving away of the intention. That's what he wants to say. Towards the understanding of typical social relations of genocide, social relations of genocide. All the societies, they invent and reinvent themselves day by day. If you are a, a suddenly ruptured come to them as, for example, they stole it off their lands. That's genocide. Because you, you make impossible the continui continuity of that culture. And uh, uh, for sure that I, I, I change a lot of ideas with Professor Silva Steiner, for my proud, the first Brazilian uh, judging the ICC, and she has a very clear idea of genocide in the cr international criminal 
uh, way. And she's right, totally right. I agree with her. But you have to change the perception of what is genocide. So we have this kind of phenomenon in Brazil. I didn't mention to you, but we had a genocide in Brazil, recognized by the Brazilian Supreme Court in 1993 against the Yanomamis, the Hashimu genocide. I can send to you material about that. And all these are uh, all these uh, 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 challenges we have now in Brazil to protect our indigenous nations. Uh, I would like to thank you, Megan, to Jenna, to Professor Apso. Please, if you could repeat the, ex the question of Professor Apso, I can answer now and of other uh, questions we uh, eventually can have. Thank you very much, Megan. Thank you so much for that very engaging presentation. Um, we do have quite a bit of questions already. I wonder if, if I unmute Professor Apsel, maybe she can repeat the question she, she asked initially. Is that okay? Okay, perfect. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, my question was about uh, seeing uh, genocide by attrition was one of the terms that I think you're describing, and that is an ongoing pattern against indigenous peoples worldwide. And do you think that that is going on in Brazil? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I, I agree with this idea. We have it in Brazil. Uh, I could say we have in Brazil two kinds of actions. The genocidal direct actions, for example, the Sinta Larga massacre, for example, this is a very clear, uh, the communities were bombed, they received uh, uh, poisonous uh, uh, sugar, poisonous uh, toys for the children. This is a direct action of genocide. And I must remember that even for those who uh, defends the, the technical vision of, uh, of genocide. We do not need only a state, a public structure committing genocide. Private organizations and farmers and landminers, illegal loggers, they can commit genocide. This was the case of Hashimu genocide I have I just mentioned to you. But on the other hand, we have some dynamics that are not a directly genocide. For example, as uh, the uh, criminal expert uh, Alicia Gilgil from Spain used to write and to say, if I decide to build a dam and in the area that must be flooded, we have two or three different indigenous nations. If they do, do not want to leave their, their lands where they have their sacred cemeteries, their sacred areas for uh, religious practices. Uh, I used to say, well, if they do not want to leave the area, they have to, to support the consequence. And I build the dam. Is it not a genocide? Is it not a genocide? If we have the Convention 169 of the ILO, International Labor Organization, obliging the previous uh, 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 consultation to the indigenous uh, uh, nations. If our constitution, now article 231, also guarantees it, if I build this dam, if I put fire in their homes, what, what is the difference? Because this is a, a kind of, uh, we used to say we have an expression in Brazil, probably abroad too, a kind of environmental racism. Uh, I put fire in their, uh, uh, in, their, in their homes, in their plantations, in their cultures, and they have to flee to the cities, to other areas, and they become uh, 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 miserable people. They lost their culture, they become miserable. Is it not an ethnocide? Because I, make the, I, I provoke the disappearance of these cultures. That's why we need a sociological view for genocide. Uh, I, I must emphasize, it does not exist. 
as my uh, as Professor Silver Steiner used to say, the idea of ecocide that was recently a discussion, a hot topic in Brazil, is not legal possibly because we do not have the crime of ecocide for sure. But we need to uh, uh, to change our view, I think. So I agree with you, Professor Epso, about your uh, th this conception of genocide and how it is really happening in Brazil. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Okay, we have some other questions here. Um, I'll read them out and we'll go from there. So we do have one here. Um, they say, I would be extremely interested to hear your perspective on this point on the impact of transboundary water agreements on indigenous populations. How apart from taking issues rising from such agreement to the ICJ, can indigenous rights be upheld and balanced against a nation's waters, water rights? especially as these relate to the immense difficulty of water governance and these terrible impacts that are inequitable water sharing agreement can have on minorities of the country. Well, if I understood the question, um, it, it concerns to the possibility to, uh, of an action before the ICC, for example. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, well, nowadays in Brazil, we have had two or three claims proposed before the ICC against our current president. I personally think that uh, we, will, we will not have a kind of, of sequence in these claims. It's very difficult. Why? Because we have a very clear criminal, international criminal law standard. But in relation to the indigenous, if uh, we show clearly the, 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 not the direct intention, but if we agree as internationalists that we have the, the risk of their extermination with the, uh, a, a governmental action, and I, I assume this risk, we should have a kind of uh, uh, genocide here. Mm. But it's not uh, what uh, prevails in the world. Uh, when I was talking again to Professor Silver Steiner, we we're talking about uh, a decision of the, judge, of the Brazilian judge at the International uh, Court of Justice, ICJ, in Hague, in The Hague. In the Hague. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he was a dissenting vote when he wrote that for genocide, to, 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 to understand for the happening of a genocide, we must not consider the specific intention, the mens rea, the dolus. We must have the possibility to understand that we have the genocide coming from the circumstances of the fact. Mm. For example, if I, if I send gunmen to an indigenous community to take them off of there, to build a dam, and I kill some of them, I beat some of them, I, I, uh, I oblige them to go to other states by airplanes, as it happened in the Brazilian dictatorship, and I put fire in their homes. I, I, I ask you, I ask you, what is, uh, please, uh, with the, the, the needed proportions, okay? But what is the dynamic of the old West in US, in the Nazi East so during the, the secular war, the Holocaust? And what I, I am describing now, we take that people that lived there for centuries, as it happened with the Armenians also, we know it, Armenians were victims of, the, of this kind of dynamics. And we take them off there, we colonize their lands, we explore the soil richness. Remember the extreme far right uh, 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 slogan, soil and blood, 
Mm. And uh, uh, professor, uh, professor, uh, he has a very good book, uh, uh, Soil and Blood, about genocide. I forgot his, his name, a very important scholarship, genocide scholar. Uh, uh, and then, if I have this, this dynamic, why it's not genocide with the indigenous Brazilian uh, peoples, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I think we must change this idea. I like uh, this position of professor, uh, of the judge Cansado Trindade, the Brazilian judge of the ICJ, but as Professor Silvio Steiner says, he's an internationalist, not an international criminalist. Right. But I, 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 I confess uh, to you and to my dear friend Silvio Steiner that I agree with his vision. Mm -hmm. Because we need to consider not on the intention yeah. that is inside the mind of the perpetrator. Why does uh, the perpetrator must have the power, the decision to, to define it? No. The dynamics between the perpetrator and the, the victim, the dynamics existent between the victims themselves, Mm -hmm. and the structure uh, established by the state that day by day conduct these people to the miserability, miserability mm -hmm. to the end of their culture, this is, must be considered for us to have a new genocide theory. Mm -hmm. Not a new, a Lemkian genocide theory. Mm -hmm. And have there been any progressive governments in the past several years in Brazil who have advocated for indigenous rights, or has it been mostly mm -hmm. grassroots movements? Well, the indigenous uh, nations in Brazil have faced, since the, the Europeans got to Brazil, uh, a very difficult situation. But we have a government uh, that uh, are open to dialogue. Okay. And uh, uh, inside a kind of civilization sphere. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, in my personal opinion, we are out a civilization, civilizational uh, uh, sphere. Uh, 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 but they have been facing always, since then, uh, since the Portuguese got here, a very difficult situation. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we have another one here. Uh, the right to physically occupy traditional lands is indeed is essential. But what is happening now is brutal effects of climate change gradually making even demarcated lands for, sorry, far less habitable than they were even a generation ago. The Brazilian filmmaker Mai Correra has documented in his film, Where Did the Swallows Go? And they sent a link. Uh, do you know anything about how climate change has impacted indigenous communities? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the most preserved, you, you can, you can, uh, uh, find this data if you, if you look for it. Mm -hmm. The most preserved forests in Brazil, forest areas in Brazil are the indigenous forests. Mm -hmm. Because they learn, uh, let, let me explain a, a very important point. This is a very good question. Mm -hmm. When the, when the, uh, the men uh, got to the Americas 40,000 years ago by Canada, and we have now, as a result of the Brazilian archaeologist research, uh, Nied Guidon, uh, she found uh, 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 carbon-14 proofs of the presence of the men here in Brazil territory uh, for 40,000 years ago. Mm. Well, it, this it's a, was a very uh, wonderful discovery. Well, they are very old. Uh, uh, nations, civilizations. We need to stop thinking about only under a European uh, uh, Eurocentric vision. We have old, old nations in Africa, in Asia, in America. In America. Mm -hmm. So, since then, they learned how to, to, to cohabit with the forests. They, they do not have their lands. They are the lands. They are the lands. I'll give an example that comes from New Zealand. Two years ago, the New Zealand government approved the recognizable 
the recognition, the cogni recognition mm -hmm. of a legal personality to the sacred river of the Maoris, the Vanganui River. You can find this document in the, at the internet. Mm -hmm. You can watch this session in the, at the New Zealand Parliament with the Maoris nation. What, what does it mean? It means that if someone touch that river, the river itself goes to the just to the court, represented by two lawyers, a Maori lawyer and an, uh, a state lawyer. What does it mean also that they, they, they uh, observed, observed mm -hmm. an indigenous cosmological view and, and and, and, and inserted it in this dominant society structure. It was a kind of inversion of the way. We usually try to assimilate, mm -hmm. right? New Zealand did the country, uh, they brought an indigenous cosmology vision to, to a state policy. Mm -hmm. This was wonderful. In Brazil, we have the same. They know how to preserve, how to extract their food, how to hunt, how to, uh, uh, to, make, to, to practice their, their uh, sacred uh, 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 acts mm -hmm. without destroying. I didn't show to you, but you have now in Brazil a new drama the the dams the the uh, uh, they are being uh, they are how can i say they are old they are not conserved mm -hmm. and some of them are falling down and the rejects are invading the cities i have an image a kind of tsunami mm. i i prefer not to show to you here Mm -hmm. That kill it, the the uh, the green river, the green river, Rio Verde in Portuguese, is a sacred river for the Karnak nation. Mm -hmm. It's 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 dead. It's dead. So uh, the there's a, a a close connection between mm -hmm. the preservation of the ecosystem. And I use a concept, a larger concept, not only the, the flora, the fauna, the animals, but also the cultural references. This is environmental, by uh, uh, ecosystem, biomes, but also, but also their uh, uh, cultural references. Mm -hmm. As an Armenian church, as a synagogue, for example. Mm -hmm. And then... They know how to preserve because they live in the Americas for many, 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 uh, uh, many a long, long time. Right, right. To destroy the indigenous culture means to destroy the environmental. They go That's why, I, yes, mm -hmm. I, I'm curious about Bi John Biden, Joe Biden's new policy in relation to Brazil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm really curious. And Ryan asks uh, a few questions as well. Um, he asks, would you consider um, Shingu National Park to be part of a forced removal process? That's his first question. I don't think it, it will happen because uh, Nash, uh, Shingu National Park is a kind of, uh, uh, it's a very important symbol to Brazil. When you talk about Shingu National Park, you talk about the result of a wonderful uh, uh, project initiated by uh, Villas Boas brothers. They were uh, uh, even indicated to the International uh, Nobel Peace, uh, Peace Nobel, mm -hmm. the Peace Nobel Prize. Nobel Peace Prize, yeah. Yeah, but they, they did not get it. But anyway, uh, the, the only fact to be indicated is a victory. And this is a very important uh, 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 indigenous reference to Brazil. Mm -hmm. I don't think it must happen, but what is happening is the consequence of the building of the Belo Monte Dam. Belo Monte Dam 
provoked, caused a very hard and destructive impact on Xingu National Park. Mm. And it's, it's still, these consequences, is, they are not totally known yet. It, right. it was a very sad moment and it didn't happen under Bolsonaro. It happened in other governments. Mm. He also asks, does the Krenak, is that how you pronounce it, the Krenak Agricultural Reformatory work yeah. as an institution of forced assimilation? Well, uh, the reformatory Krenak uh, was a prison. The, uh, the, well, in Brazil, we have a, a, a situation that uh, looks like a little with a Canada situation. Mm -hmm. In Canada, we have the mountain, mountain police, right? They are yep. military. Yeah. They yep. are not civil. Yep. They are military. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. We had uh, Andrew, Andrew that studied with me at Zoria. Mm -hmm. Some years ago, he was a, 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 a he is, I think, a, a military uh, mount, uh, from the mountain police, mm -hmm. mountain police. In Brazil, we have the civil police that make the investigation of the crimes, and another police, the military police, mm -hmm. under a military regime. For you to have an idea, in São Paulo, all the state I live, we have more than one thousand. Uh, 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 1,000, 30, 30 policemen here. It's an army. Wow. And they are an auxiliary force of the armed forces in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And during dicta the dictatorship, they cr the military police of the state of Minas Gerais, each state of the federation, Brazil is a federation like Canada, mm -hmm. uh, has its military police the Minas Gerais, state of Minas Gerais military police built this prison inside Karnak land. And all the indigenous from Brazil that were considered against the regime was taken to this prison. You have the ruins of, the, of the, this prison. And we also have a documentary at YouTube, but it's in Portuguese. Anyway, we can try to, uh, to, to translate it too. And this, uh, this uh, prison was a center of torture, uh, disappearance, uh, violations, not only physical violations, but cultural violations also. And today we are trying to, to convert these ruins in a memorial. But why the, the, the dictatorship in Brazil murdered more than 80,300 indigenous individuals, those that, that we could prove, we probably will never know how many of them were killed. But why? They were not uh, members of uh, left organi arm, armed uh, gunned organizations. Mm -hmm. Why they were killed? Because they are considered until today obstacles to the developmentism. This is the issue that Shelton Davis, I showed his book to you, yeah. uh, uh, some mentions, that Shelton Davis used to write. And it, it exists until today. Bolsonaro wants to give access to the indigenous land, to the mining companies, to the loggers. If it happens, it's the end of, this na of these nations. It's the end of these cultures. Yeah. It cannot occur. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, did the Brazilian government adopt a blood quantum as a legal designation of ethnic identity? Uh, you mean you mean a, a policy for this? Uh, is that the, the... Uh, blood quantum? It's in quotation marks. Let me see here, Ryan. I don't uh, know if you can read. Uh, 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 affirmative action. Mm. You mean an affirmative action? Let me see. Ryan, I don't know if you could raise your hand and I can unmute you. Maybe you can explain what that is. Let's see here. Okay, there we go. Hi, Ryan. Can you hear us? Hi, Ryan. How are you? I just have to unmute your mic. Okay, I think you can hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yeah I can hear. 
trying to draw parallels uh, with the United States, something a history I'm more familiar with. And, um, you know, bl the blood quantum determined sort of whether or not you're considered to be ethnically indigenous or not. Right. And I know with a society like Brazil, with a lot of mixture, if there, if there is, and you're right on the right track, Professor, with regards to affirmative action or other reasons for designation, if uh, Brazil recognizes, how, how Brazil recognizes uh, indigenous identity or African identity, European identity, et cetera. Okay, great, great question, right. Thank you for, for it. Uh, in Brazil, the criteria for identification is the self-identification. I recognize myself as, uh, as, uh, as black people, as indigenous people, person. We, we uh, declare it for sure. Uh, in some specific cases, we had some problems with it. But uh, the criteria is that in Brazil, we have 0.4% of the population as indigenous, 52 as black people, 48% as white people. But you do not have, now it's a little better due to the affirmative actions. I'll talk about it that you, you asked me. But now it's a little better, but you do not have black people in the majority of the universities. You do, not have, you do not have indigenous people in the universities. You do not have black women, black women in the main positions in the companies. Just to give an example. This is a very serious problem in Brazil because uh, 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 we have a kind of, of standard, of, uh, of framework, a social and economical framework that benefits the white man. Okay. Due to this, some years ago, during the Lula government, the affirmative actions, just like in the US, we studied a lot here, uh, uh, the sup US Supreme Court cases, Plessy versus Ferguson, for example, the Jim Crow laws. Uh, we have some difference, but we have some some experience that we can change. And due to this action, uh, uh, in the last years, I, I am a 25 years, prof uh, I am a professor for 25 years. Now I remember, and now I can see that I'm having more black students. Indigenous, very, very difficult. Because the universities, uh, a school of law, for example, that I visited in the state of Paraná, in the south of Brazil, they have a, a very good uh, uh, reservation for indigenous. But when the indigenous student goes to the university, sometime after, uh, they leave the core, the, the, the school. Why? Because the teaching structure do not consider their realities. And uh, sometimes they feel themselves as discriminated, they suffer racism uh, and so on. But we have these actions in Brazil. It, provo it caused some improvements. But now, <laughs> under this kind of Trump's, Trump's phase, Trump's period and Bolsonaro's period, the speech, uh, the, the expressive speech against this kind of social inclusion became more and more clear, especially in the internet. We must study the impact of technology in, 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 in this kind of situation. Mm -hmm. The internet, as Umberto Eco said, uh, gave us a lot of space and resources, but also turned the, the, an idiot as a, a thinker, a great thinker in the internet. But even so, uh, I know that in US, we have some one or two claims against some universities to, to end the, the affirmative actions. In Brazil, we have this kind of position too. But I think the majority of the Brazilian population uh, understand that this is very important. I, could, I should give you another statistic. 
We have in Brazil 800,000 imprisoned people. Seven or 80% of these people are black. But why are they not at the universities? Right. This is the colonial thinking that still exists. We defeated the Nazi fascism in Europe, but we do not defeat, we did not defeat the colonialism thinking, way of thinking. We must do it. Mm -hmm. I, I hope I have answered your question, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Professor Flavio, thank you so much for a, a wonderful presentation today. We really appreciate you joining us. And thank you to all the participants of this webinar as well. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to send us an email or Professor Flavio an email. Uh, we'll also have the recording available for you as of tomorrow. So if you missed any part of the presentation or want to share it with a friend, um, you will receive the link or you can visit our website to learn more as well. Um, and please join us next Tuesday at 2 p.m. Uh, same time, we'll be discussing immigrant rights in the United States with Tanya golash Boza. And finally, on a final, final note, um, if you want to learn more about the Institute's Genocide and Human Rights University program, we're hoping it will be held in 2021 if it's safe for everyone to come travel here to Canada. Um, so keep checking in on our website for updates. And if you have any questions, again, feel free to send us an email. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Professor Epsil. Uh, great professor for me. Thank you, George, uh, and all my friends and alumni at Surian Institute, and to our colleagues that were with us here. If you need the material, I can send you, Megan, by PDF, and okay. you can send to, the, to our friends here. I'd be happy to. Great. See you next week. See you next week. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.